Hey there, everyone. That Sexy Nerd is back again, and we're watching uh, more extra history. Uh, so now we're probably starting to get into the darker parts of uh, Henry Ford, and uh, yeah, it's not looking so good. It's starting to look like a certain racist individual that's out today. <laughs> I don't know. At least that's what I've been hearing. I don't know. Businessman that somehow turns an evil out of nowhere. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? But anyway, uh, I, well, maybe they were always evil. Yeah, actually they were. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, as far as I know, he, he seemed to at least be somewhat of a genius and, you know, just doing what I, I don't understand why it, it goes that way. But arrogance and and whatever, thinking highly of yourself, I guess, causes you to have bad thoughts or just not as much respect for your fellow man who knows i wouldn't know but uh yeah i really want to see what the heck happens in the next story so let's just get into the video and remember please smash that like button if you want to see more sexy and nerdy content and subscribe if you think i deserve it and let's do this thing out. ford plant highland park 1913 henry ford has just returned from a long trip to europe being fawned over by the press for his technical acumen and five dollar workday and on his return, a team of engineers, including his son Edsel, unveil a surprise for him. A new prototype. A lovingly updated Model T with new sleek bodywork. He's probably gonna hate it. Ford walks around the car, inspecting it. Then, he opens the driver's side door as if to get behind the wheel. Instead, he rips it off. Oh! He then walks to the passenger side and destroys that door I too. thought so. Then he smashes the windshield. I knew it. Stomps the fenders off and kicks in both headlights. In shocked silence, the team watches as Henry Ford demolishes their painstakingly crafted gift. Ford is teaching them a lesson. This is his company, and the Model T is his car. A perfect car. And no one, absolutely no one, will take it away from him. This series on Henry Ford was chosen by our awesome patrons over on Patreon. And if you want to have a say in the historical topics that we actually make shows about, stay tuned until after the episode. To those that knew him, Ford had always had a dual nature. For instance, I'd, I'd, while he gave his son Edsel every advantage, he was also an overbearing, controlling father. And his famous ability to take on all comers, admired in many instances, also made him hostile, temperamental, and abusive. He also loved boyish pranks, but as he grew older, they became more mean-spirited. In fact, at his first factory, he once hooked up a battery to a urinal so oh my God! a shock when used. Still, employees loved him for his common touch and willingness to pitch in on the factory. Dude, did he kill anybody that way? Holy shit. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Floor. And despite the sinister undertones of Ford inspecting workers' homes, most employees, even the journalist Ida Torbell, who you can learn more about in our oh, Tanny the Truck series, praised his social programs. After <coughs> all, the $5 daily <coughs> wage changed their lives. In a few years, it raised the average savings of a Ford worker from $200 to $2,000 and made it possible for their children to attend school rather than work themselves. Plus, Ford's minimum wage became the standard in American manufacturing, vaulting millions to the middle class. Wow. His techniques of mass production, at the time called Fordism, also spread, lowering the cost of manufactured goods. These policies were transformative for the American workers, perhaps even more than the Model T, and Ford was celebrated as a hero for it. But in 1914, hmm. a darker side of Ford began to emerge because he began thinking that he was, in fact, the lone genius that the press treated him as. Arrogance. Instead of just engineering and business, he assumed he could speak knowledgeably as a master of any topic. Arrogance. From politics to society to war and peace. And he forgot he hadn't done everything himself. Mm -hmm. Soon, Ford began butting heads with James Cousins, who had for years successfully reigned in Ford's worst qualities and channeled his best ones. But in 1913, Ford decided that Cousins would no longer restrain his genius. He publicly contradicted and undermined Cousins in meetings, went around his back. And at one point, when Cousins asked him to sign receipts for borrowing company property, Ford instead burned them. But the break came as a result of really? World War I. Throughout his life, Ford was an avowed peace activist. He believed war to be wasteful and unproductive. It broke down rather than built up. Yeah, the war sure. in Europe, he said, was nothing to do with America or the average man. Was he right? 
Well, no. kind of, but he also called American soldiers lazy and insane, would later say the Lusitania's civilian victims, quote, had been warned, and blamed the war on a shadowy cabal of, quote, bankers and financiers. So, oh, yeah. boy. Then in December of 1915, he chartered a ship in a highly naive scheme to send a delegation of peace activists to neutral Norway to negotiate an end to the war. And it gets this trip was sunk. a disaster, as you can imagine, and Ford abandoned the delegation the moment they made dock. Journalists wow. also found him shockingly ill-informed on the state of current events in the war. The last straw for Cousins was Ford using a company letterhead for these activities and trying to publish an anti-war editorial in the Ford Company newspaper. Uh -oh. He resigned, later going on to become mayor of Detroit and a longtime U.S. senator. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Dodge brothers, who were now building their own cars, mind you, and Ford's other investors had had it with him. He I was never imagine. supposed to be solely in charge of the company and had clearly shuffled money around to avoid paying investors. The guy could have just like been like just taken off to the side and just enjoyed his damn retirement. Because, but you know, arrogance is a poison. <laughs> like a certain somebody else. Yet it was his plan to divert $55 million of dividend payments to build a giant new plant on the Rouge River that finally pushed things too far. Shh. From the Dodge's standpoint, Ford's Model T price cuts, the $5 wage, and his aggressive expansion had come at the cost of the shareholders. They successfully sued him, forcing him to halt construction plans and pay out a $20 million dividend. Whoa. Ford had enough of being controlled. For decades, he'd been resentful of his investors, men who, from his perspective, contributed nothing but money. So he formulated a plan to cut them out. In 1918, he retired, passing the presidency to Etzel, then loudly started talking to the press about forming a new company in competition with the old one. He would make a new car, he told reporters, half the price of the Model T, and better engineered. Shareholders panicked, thinking Ford's new venture would put the Ford Motor Company out of business. So when purchasing agents approached them offering a good price for their Ford stock, every single investor sold thinking the shares could only drop in value. But those agents were secretly buying on behalf of Henry and Edsel. And when the deal closed, the Ford Motor Company was the largest wholly family-owned company in the world. Oh. And Ford could now do whatever he wished, including cutting out almost everyone who'd helped him form the company and make the Model T in the first place. Mm. By that time, the company was turning out anti-submarine patrol boats and aircraft engines for the war effort. Now, Ford hadn't changed his ideas about the war, but once the U.S. joined, he wasn't going to shirk his patriotic duty. While well, few of the boats or engines and, arrived in time... And also profit off of it. Profit off of it. That's his patriotic duty, isn't it? For combat, it was still a successful test of American manufacturing's ability to pivot from civilian to defense production. <laughs> Yet the end of the war brought no relief. For in 1919, Ford experienced the worst courtroom drama of his life. See, he'd sued the Chicago Tribune for libel, after it ran an article calling him an anarchist and ignorant idealist. With the trial hanging on whether those accusations were true, Ford had to personally take the stand to refute both claims. Though it was immediately clear he was no anarchist, the cross-examination exposed how uninformed Ford was on the basic facts of American history and government. Mm. On the stand, he said the American Revolution took place in 1812 <laughs> and identified <laughs> Benedict Arnold as a famous writer. He denigrated the idea of studying history altogether, saying he was interested in the future and that leaders' knowledge of the past hadn't helped prevent the Great War, so... Ford won the case. Amy. What? What? Bullshit. Only six cents in damages, but the coverage was absolutely uh. brutal. <laughs> and Ford, who had already cut so many people out of his life, drew further inward and became angrier. And one outlet for that anger was a personal column he had in the Dearborn Independent, a struggling local newspaper that he'd purchased. There, Ford decided his next great social crusade would be against the people he considered responsible for the start of the First World War, as well as everything else he didn't like. And now we've gotten to the part Germany. that the foreshadow has been warning us Jews. about. In May of 1912, Ford I knew it! I, was I said Germany just being optimistic, but of course... All these lazy, freaking, jealous, evil people have to do is all they do whenever things go wrong is blame the Jews. It's so ridiculous, man. Why? Why are they just so unaccepting of their own issues, man? 
first article in a series called The International Jew, The World's Problem. Asshole. In over 90 articles, based on ideas Ford expressed to the ghostwriter who actually penned them, the series alleged a vast and improbable conspiracy controlling every aspect of life. According to these articles, Jewish plotters were behind everything White from the First World man. War to the rise of square dancing and jazz music. They were behind U.S. monetary policy and ruined the sport of baseball. Not only did they supposedly control Hollywood, but also bootleg liquor and the Irish Catholic political machine of Tammany Hall. And in one piece, clearly still stinging uh -huh. from his trial, he said they were the reason Benedict Arnold turned traitor. These articles, legitimized by Ford's signature, mind you, were incredibly dangerous. There especially no since Jews. every Ford dealership had to stock the Independent, giving it a national reach and eventually a circulation of 700,000. And he later published them as a three-volume book with a slightly tweaked title. The oh International God. Jew, the world's foremost problem. Oh Ford God. eventually withdrew the volumes and shut down the paper in 1927 yeah, after being sued for libel by a man targeted in the articles. Ford denied all knowledge of the articles, claiming someone else had written them under his name and apologized. But only after Clara threatened to divorce him, what? though it was already too late. The first German edition of his book had already come in 1922 and landed in the hands of a young Adolf Hitler, Hitler who saw much that he liked in Henry Ford. Of course he did! Damn it! Damn it! That's ridiculous! That is so messed up, man. Now I feel bad for now. I, now I feel like crap for owning a Ford, man. Oh, it's so embarrassing. Oh, 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 wow, just one video. And again, the you know what? I'll say it. the The ties to Donald Trump are uncanny. Honestly, he also makes stupid uh, claims about history. He thinks he's right about everything. And un well. The only thing is that Henry Ford, unlike Henry Ford, he did nothing. He just stood there and was a, a figurehead of his company, no matter how much uh, people like to say it. But, you know, that's a, that's a thing for another time. But, man, that, that is ridiculous, man. He actually inspired Adolf Hitler and, in turn, inspired the damn Holocaust. That is evil, man. And it's always car manufacturers. The freaking German with uh, Volkswagen and... It, it, it's... Ugh. It's, oh. Oh, that's a shame. What do you guys think? Uh, like, this is probably the most interesting video because, like, again, I was so on his side, but wow, that took a dark turn. And, and we all knew it was going to happen. I just didn't know how dark it was going to be. But again, let me know what you think in the comments. And remember, please, smash that like button if you want to see more sexy and nerdy content and subscribe if you think I deserve it. And I'll see you on the next video.